David King, as always, alongside of me. Kingy, good morning. Morning, Conzi. Fantastic. Well, it wasn't a great spectacle last night, but it was a great contest. It was it was there till the end. The Lions had their opportunities to do something quite brilliant late and snatch that game. But the Dogs the dogs were brilliant, weren't they? They brought an effort and an attitude that was hard to deny. Absolutely. And I thought some of the, the best stuff last night was, was their skipper, Marcus Bontempelli. I sort of looked at his numbers this morning and... I was a bit shocked at uh, how underwhelming they are on paper like because it felt like the influence that he had was huge. But he's 28, nine clearances. I thought he physically inserted himself onto this game like, um, like good captains do, and I thought it was a coming-of-age moment for him. He spoke during the week, so then to speak and then to back it up. I thought he was enormous last night, Marcus Bontempelli. So for me, Kingy, that was one of the best bits for the Bulldogs last night. What about you? Well, he, he hadn't been a, a, a hit-to player. The Ruckman haven't been hitting it to him. They've been hitting it to Liberatore and McRae mm. and mm. those other guys. And I reckon last night they said, you know what? He's our best player. He's our captain. Let's just let him take control. So the numbers don't read like a dominant performance, but seven, no. a seven clearance is, is significant. For him, he hasn't. As I said, he hasn't been that sort of player this 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 season so far. Four centre bounce clearances. That's where they smashed them. Twelve four out of the middle, and the Lions couldn't move the ball without Daniel Rich. They looked a bit. They looked a bit lost down back. To be fair, um, but I think you have to take your hat off uh, to the captain. Absolutely. But the best bit for me, the, the the best bit of the night, the most memorable part of the night will be probably in the post match. I mm. thought the way Jamara handled himself as a young man, 20 years of age, um, after an awful week, a challenging week for him and the football club, I thought was quite special. And I thought it was well done by the Bulldogs as well. I mean, to you know, to put him up with the coach, Luke Beveridge, and speak about the week that he'd had, it was a, a terrific insight into the hurt and to the pain that was caused during the week. I, I thought Luke himself spoke exceptionally well, but there's there's a maturity about Jamar, Jamara Hugo Hagen that perhaps what well, you know, as you would expect, wasn't there in his first couple of years, but he's growing before our eyes. So he's kicked five out of their ten. <laughs> that's a, that's an enormous performance on primetime television against a very good opponent when his team desperately needed it. So, yeah, I think they've managed him pretty well. They made him earn his stripes early on, clearly wasn't fit enough. He, he looks ripped. He looks lean. Uh, his marking is good. I think his attack on the footy has, has really improved. You've got a couple of other lesser lights that you'd like to highlight. Yeah, I thought, I thought Oscar Baker showed something last night. Just as a wingman, it's a, it's a tough role to play because you often don't get a lot of football. So he had 18 touches last night. Mm. He was the number one score involvement player for the Dogs. So, I mean, that, that's a significant night. for, he was for good. Yeah, he, he brought some energy too, which they really needed. And I know we've talked about Ed Richards before, but, but to go and play on Link McCarthy, who was largely unsighted last night, mm. and then Charlie Cameron, in the second half, I, I just thought it was just a great uh, blanketing role. We know he can win the ball back and he can counter punch. He's a good ball user and all those sorts of things. He still did all that, but to shut down those two dangers. I mean, once once McCarthy and Cameron were shut down, there there were no avenues to go. No. So no. I, I think you got to take your hat off to to Ed Richards, who, who's played a, a pretty important part for the Dogs over the last twelve months. What were the best bits for you? One three hundred. 736 I thought Lockie Neal's game was worthy of recognition as well. He is the the cleanest player at ground level in the comments. It's, uh, it's uncanny how uh, simple, how good he is at picking the footy up. It's just, just uh, eight ground ball gets again, eight clearances, four tackles, 31. Thought he used it pretty well. So he led the front. And Harris Andrews. So I thought the two captains for Brisbane were terrific. I, and I thought Andrews one of the better games I've seen him play in a long time. Um, six intercept marks he took, 21. Uh, he went at 81. He used, used the footy really well and I think was the number one ranked player. Might have been second behind Tim English on the ground. So he needed a big year and I thought the two skippers at, at Brisbane delivered, as did Marcus Bontempelli, the other skipper, so on the other side. Can I ask you before we go to some calls, where does that leave you with the coach? Because I think people are quick to assess... Luke Beveridge, the coach, and, and, and talk in a negative fashion about he hasn't done this, he hasn't done that, he hasn't done this. It's a fair effort to get this emotional response and, and at least, sna you know, not snatch is not the right word, but yeah. deliver a performance that, that delivers a win. He, so he needs the credit for last night's performance, but my criticism are, is around th that is the standard with this group that they've got. I think last night they showed... When he can motivate the group like this and when they have a structure in place and when they are 
you know, when they do bring that physicality and the pressure and the tackling, that's what this group is capable of. So why far too often do we not see this from the Western Bulldogs? Why so often do they have multiple goals kicked against them? Why so often can't they defend? And does that pressure go missing? Why can't he get the best out of this extremely talented group mm -hmm. that he's got? It is my question. So I said on Wednesday, some games you just you have to win. You just got no option but to do everything. You have to win. You have to get your players up to it. They did that. Big tick. But I'm not convinced. I mean, they've mm -hmm. kicked... They've kicked 24 goals in three weeks. Yeah. And they've kicked 10 last night and five of them came from a young forward. And four from so, three kicks. Yeah, and, and four from three kicks and one from a mark to lob that wasn't a mark. So, <laughs> my, you know, my queries around the Western Bulldogs haven't been solved last night. And Luke Beveridge's ability to get the best out of this extraordinary talented group, uh, I think those uh, still remain. Um, what about the worst bits, Kingy, last night? There was a 50-meter penalty that was a bit of a brain fade. Yeah. Oh, mate, Riley Garcia had a funny night, didn't he? Funny night. But anyway, uh, the worst bits for me, I think anything over 195 centimetres last night, with the exception of Harris Andrews had a pretty good night. It was a struggle, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, neither think, forward did, line or key posts could light up. The Ruckman were, were just so-so. Um, yeah, it makes me worry about, and I know we'll get to it in a minute, but it makes me worry about the, the, the tall forwards, particularly of Brisbane. I, I think Norton's shown... He's shown his wares quite consistently, and, and, and Jamara kicked five last night. So you don't you don't go to the depths. Maybe mm. you should, but they're just a box of chocolates. That forward line at the, the Brisbane Lions. You never know what Eric's going to do. You've got no certainty in what Joe did. There was a moment last night where the forwards were charging forward. Charlie Cameron out the back. Jack Gunston free in the corridor, charging inside mm. fifty. He's on. He's had the big third term. He kicked three goals mm. halfway through the last. It's, it's line ball who's going to win the game. And Joe turns from 52 metres out and has a shot. And, and he wasn't having the sort of night that was going to give you any confidence he'd kick it. I just thought, you know what, that, that is them in a nutshell. Well, I'll say it. They, they can't win the premiership with, with Danaher and Hipwood. And the, the decision to give Eric Hipwood a seven-year contract, I, I said this two <laughs> weeks ago, this is, why, this is the reason, and people get sick of it, this is the reason I bang on about it. He's contracted to Brisbane until the end of 2029. He touches the ball six times a game. And if you're lucky, you get one goal from him. And then you get all the other frustrations that come with it. And they've thought, you know what, this is the guy we're going to give a seven-year contract to. It's it's astounding. And um, Danaher is maybe the most frustrating player in the competition because he's good is as good as anyone. And I don't reckon Jack Gunston signed up for this kingy at the age of 31, 32. He, he's, he's not there to be the main target and the one that everyone's relying upon to get them back into the game and taking contested marks in the forward line and having his hamstring stepped on by a boot in the third quarter. He, he wants the others to do the grunt work and he'll be the, the the icing on the cake, not the main guy. I don't reckon he signed up for that. So I think there'd be some frustration with with Jack as well. Oh, I think it's a, good, it's a good question. Of the contenders, right, of the teams that you think are contenders, is this the most difficult group to coach? Because you're driving to the game last night. How would Chris Fagan be feeling? Mm. He'd be thinking, okay, I know what Lockie Neal's going to do. I, I, mm. I know what Josh Dunkley's going to do. Harris Andrews, yeah, he'll have some moments, but he, you know, he's, he's one of our leaders. Starswitch I thought was pretty good. And then you work your way through. I thought Wilmot was really good, showing some, mm. some really good signs. Early. I think I've got an idea what, what McAdoo is I've got an idea what Gunston's going to do. But the rest, I mean, the, the, the gap between their best and their worst for Charlie Cameron. Eric Hipwood, Joe Danaher, Rainer. Link, Link McCart, Rain, Rainer. Where, where is Rainer at the moment? They can't, they can't find a spot for him. Hugh McCluggage had a poor night, but he's been a consistent player over yeah. the last couple of years. You've got no idea who the next tall back actually is for the Lions at the moment. I know Gardner's on his way back, but is it the most difficult coaching job of the five, six, seven contender type teams? When you don't know what you're going to get. I'd put the Western Bulldogs in with that as well. You know, you know what you're going to get from Bontempelli, but do I know Daniel? You know, do I know what uh, Bailey Dale is going to give me? Do I know what Josh Bruce is going to Liam Jones? So I, I think it was two teams, and it was the Western Bulldogs who I thought were, were tougher and, and in the end probably wanted it more. But oh, it was an enthralling game of football. I don't think there's any sweeping overreactions from it other than you'd be really questioning whether... Brisbane can win the flag with the two uncompetitive key forwards at times, not always, at times, that they've got, and that was shown again last night. That next defender, next-ranked defender, in the absence of Marcus Adams, which they knew, 
I just think last night you saw what Liam Jones can bring. And that's the guy that was 20 minutes down the road that I think should be on the Brisbane list now, mm. playing effectively full back and freeing up Harris Andrews. But but not to, my, my question for you, Cornsey, are the Brisbane Lions David Ferrer? Like they're good. <laughs> they're good, right? And he's good, you're good enough to get I to us. I think David Ferrer gave more effort, though. He well, was uncompromising with his effort. Got to the semi final of the Australian did. Open twice, got to the final of the French once, got to the quarter final at Wimbledon twice, got to the semi final of the US Open twice, but never really won anything. Well, he didn't have the we- he didn't have the weapons. He just keeps running into one better. Exactly. But, so he it's didn't, Djokovic, yeah. it's Federer, absolutely it's, Murray. It's all of them. And, and is that just Brisbane? Are, are they mm. are they always? There's always just one better. Why is there always one better? <laughs> and they've. I think the Brisbane Lions have got more physical capabilities than David Ferrer had. He, he was built like Leighton Hewitt, but he? he gave effort. But you're right. He he, he got there. He's consistent for 15 years, but. Never was able to win it. Kingy, did you see anything tactically last night that you thought was of, of interest in the game? Well, not really, except that the Dogs, for the first time in a long time, defensively just locked up the ground. Mm. Brisbane, you would have thought that Brisbane would, would have been able to move the ball far more effectively out of the back half than what they were. Uh, I think that you've been talking about how porous they've been in allowing the opposition to take the ball coast to coast. Uh, quite regularly this season, you know, 15th ranked, I think they were last year. And last night, the Lions had 84 opportunities to bring the ball out of their back. I, I hate, I'll say that again, 84 opportunities 84. For, for only three goals. I mean, that, that's yeah. that's that's not them. Um, and, and you can have an off night, but that's twice they've travelled now and been, and, and been disappointing. So I just wonder well, that, if, the, if it's going to be a theme for the Lions. Yeah, well, uh, so... Good at home, um, and their record is amazing at home when you yeah. look at it. But uh, don't like wearing the, the white shorts, Brisbane, for whatever reason. Um, what happens to a player when all pre-season you um, have a new role, you train in a new role, you go to all the meetings in your new role, it's spoken about what an asset you're going to be, and then halfway through the third game, I'm talking about Cam Rayner here, that's out the window and you're back forward. I mean, the, the psyche of, of that and then how to fit in Rayner with, with Zorko, who they want to play forward, with McCarthy, with Cameron, with Bailey, with all of the others. So I just think that's why you've got to be pretty careful when you decide to make sweeping positional changes to your group. Because I, if I'm Cam Rayner, I'm going, this isn't, this isn't good for his footy, I don't reckon, right now. He'd be wondering where he's going to play next week. But is isn't is there a bit of onus on the player as well to actually mm. to, to actually command a position and, and control your own destiny as a player? Look, he hasn't he hasn't done it as a small forward. He hasn't done it as a centre bounce midfielder well, going 20, he forward. Kicked a, he kicked twenty four last year, a goal a game off the back of a a knee. And I just thought, as you and I have spoken about, that there was a, a fair bit to work with him in that role. But is twenty four a, a big number? In that offense, no, it's a, it's a, it, no, it's a, not. It's not a big number by any means, but it's a, it's enough, I think, to work with off the back of a, a knee. And he kicked four in round twenty, I think it was at Marvel. And you think, okay, well, here we go. He's ready to go. Mm. Um, and they've gone, no, well, he's not. Uh, see, I, I think you flip them. I think Zorko at thirty-four does Pendlebury across half back, and Rayner plays half forward. And I think Dane Zorko even has publicly said that he'd prefer to play half yeah. back. Not that that. Not that that matters, but so, I, you know, I just wonder whether they're good, wasting a, a big asset. It's a good chat. You can't, and you, in this modern game, you can't waste assets. I just wonder whether whether the, Joe Danaher is a better second ruck than Darcy Ford. Mm, mm. He is, and they're too tall in the forward line anyway at times. Eric and Darcy down. I wonder whether Fags has to make the call. Yeah. Hey Darcy, it's not necessarily your fault, but for, for the balance of the team, it's almost a decision between. Fort and Hipwood for that second tall forward spot. Well, it didn't happen in the finals last year against Brisbane where McStay went in, went in rucks. They, and they, looked, missing, they looked better. They're going to miss him. And, and you don't know what you got till it's gone sometimes. But the, 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 the second ruck doesn't really help them. And when they want to release Danaher out of the forward line, they really can't, they really can't hide mm. Hipwood or Danaher at points. So I, I think their biggest decision from a match committee point of view is what, whether they need two rucks. Hey, I was a bit perplexed with Chris Fagan's comments on Josh Dunkley's game. Let's have a listen. He didn't play his greatest game, but he's very competitive like he always is and, and uh, had, had a real go. So, uh, no, Josh, he'd be disappointed with his game, but but um, yeah, he made a decent contribution and did some things during the night that 
really courageous things that, to try and lift the team. I thought I thought he was better than that. I thought he was, I thought he was one of their better players. I thought it was more than an average game that he'd be disappointed with. How would you see it? He it was a tough uh, week for him against his old side. I thought it was just an average. I mean, just 20 average 24 game. touches in the midfield. That that's mm. a that's a low bar. What four, second most for the team. Yeah, but they were ordinary, weren't they? Four yeah, four on, clearances yeah, from the center bounce. Yeah. One center bounce clearance, two score involvements. No, no effect on the game for me. He'd be mm. disappointed that he couldn't impact the game more than mm. what he did. And I'll tell you what's going to happen up there is that Will Ashcroft is going to go past some of these guys and give them wind burn. He's going to be <laughs> – he's, he's, this kid did some things last night. Off the back of what he showed last week, you go, wow, this is, this is an exceptional talent. Yeah. I, I, I don't know who's going to win the Rising Star, but if you're beating Will Ashcroft, you've had some sort of first year. Yeah, it's down racing two, isn't it, uh, for the rising star. The Friday Agenda. Well, I shouldn't say this, um, but I don't think we are going to be asking the AFL for a priority pick. That was Sam Mitchell uh, with that comment moments ago, uh, and the Friday Agenda is for Signet, power every moment with a Signet power bank. I was glad to hear him say it because if you cut as deep as what you do and if you get rid of all your – well, some of your, most of your experienced players, you're expecting this to be the result. So to then turn around and go, we want our handout with a priority pick, I think that is an admirable admission after the first two weeks that they've had. Yeah, and we've talked about that a little bit with him over the journey, and he's always held that firm view. But but if you're the AFL, do you, do you want this club to be in this position for six years? Well, what did North? What did North get? A couple of second round. I don't second have a third, in front I of think. me. Yeah, yeah. Which they use for for Logan Darcy Tucker. I think. I think I'm correct in saying that. Yep, correct me if I'm wrong. North fans, Spot you on. will. Yep. Um, and that's been handy. I mean, Logue's been handy. Yeah, I think you need to give more personally. Yeah. I think you look at. You're running the business. You you can't have a, a fan base. You know, ki- these kids, you can't have them going to primary school and not having them competitive until they, they're halfway through year ten. But you, you can't also can't. get rid of O'Meara, who they could have kept. They could have kept Mitchell. They couldn't have kept Gunston, but but others. And then in the next twelve months, go. We want a priority pick. No, no, I don't mean the next twelve months. No, no, I, I'm a little bit with you. You've got to let it play out, and it is done by design. But all, but all of these things are done through through club error. And, and your own, you've orchestrated your own demise. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see those two things as being necessarily mutually exclusive. Talk to me about Fremantle, Kingy, who you've spoken a lot about this week. I think this is the biggest coaching game for Justin Longmuir in, in his short coaching career. And I know he's only fourth year and they've gone 7, 10 and, and 13 wins. But if you look at the end of the Ross Lyon tenure, in, in 2016 they won four games and they went 8-8. Eight, eight, Four and two, or eight, eight, nine and two, I think it was. And in that period, they built the start of this rebuild w- was was developing before our very eyes. So Darcy Brayshaw, and I know Chera, who's no longer there, but they got they got um, they got stuff back for that for that loss. They did yeah. Young and Sarong and Henry. All these got this list build for me has been off the back of that that period. And the last couple of drafts as well uh, haven't hurt. So Justin's been able to go seven wins, ten wins, thirteen wins last year, and, and enter into a final series. So at zero two. A game against the West Coast Eagles that everyone has in their bottom four and says they're miles off and they're miles away and they're not even playing the right way and Adam Simpson's under pressure and all these sorts of things yep. is a game they just have to win. If 2023 is to bring any form of success, this game is a, an absolute must. There is n- nothing sure than that. Well, exactly what you're saying is accurate. They've been one of the bis- biggest disappointments um, this year. And I want to continue that theme, but with another um, interstate team. This is a massive game. Well, for both South Australian clubs and coaches, the, the fallout for Ken Hinckley and Matthew Nix is going to be significant for the loser. So put that in your bank for Monday morning. But for Matthew Nix, I'm looking at it going, I, I really rated what he'd done. I rated the, the football that he had the team playing, and I still do. I think for patches this year already, they've played some excellent football. They haven't been able to do it for long enough. He's 18 and 44 throughout his coaching career. He's one and four against the arch nemesis Port Adelaide. He's lost the first two winnable games. I mean, GWS is a really winnable game. And then Richmond at home, you would think is maybe not 50-50, but certainly winnable. And for the Crows draw, they go uh, Port, Frio, 
Carlton, Hawthorne, Collingwood, Geelong. That that's the next period for for Matthew Nix and Adelaide. At some point, your club needs a win, like Fremantle, like the Western Bulldogs did last night. Matthew Nix needs a win badly uh, on Saturday night in the showdown. So I just wanted to put that on the agenda. Anything else for me? Well, just has Matty Nix got enough to work with though? This is this is my discussion. I know. I know. <sighs> Can I just run you through the drafts that now should be fulfilling the the, the core of their list? So in, in 2015, so if you draft those kids in 2015, they're now 25. They're, they're ready to they're ready to go. They've been in the system for for seven years or so, and they they are taking control of the ten that come on the list in 2015. Only Wayne Miller and Tom Doday mm. are still there. 2016, they brought in six. Luchy. They brought in Tom. six. Only Himmelberg's yeah. still there. Of the seven they bought in 2017, only Darcy Fogarty is playing. In fact, there's only three still on the list. So 2018, yeah, the recruiting, Jones. The recruiting's been a mess. So whose fault's that? The recruiters. So, so, uh, well, however, they have they have bought some weapons in. Just this year? Yeah. Well, well, last year Dawson came in. He's, he's now the captain of the footy club. Rankin comes in. The forward line is is chock full of talent. Rochelle is, is a good player. Laird's a, a very good player. They've got some experienced defenders. And they're playing the right way. So I, I don't think you can say our list is no good. And that's an excuse to, for, for Matthew Nix. I think it buys think him time. Sh- how long? Well, I mean, if you if your first round draft picks and Jones and McHenry aren't even in the can't even get in the team, <laughs> and, and Mackesy's no longer at the club, I mean, you, you've got to give the guy a reasonable list quality to compete with, surely. What what is it? Is that the list? Is it the coaching? How much grace should you get? Because on the in the other hand, I've seen them play some scintillating footy. I mean, the third quarter against Richmond was unbelievable. So why? So we're saying that's that's great. But for the rest of it, it's the list. No, I, I so think, I think the there method, needs to be a. I think the method's pretty good. They're six best in the competition for turning a, a, a chain into a score. They've got an inside fifty that that creates scoring the best in the competition, but they're inaccurate. Their accuracy has killed them more than anything else this season. And yep, I, I, I think, think I think that comes down to coaching. I'm, you, you might see it wrong, but see, I I, I tell you what, he, he'd be if you give him if you gave him the job. At Fremantle, or the Gold Coast, or or GWS, somewhere like that, with a, with a greater level of talent, he, he would do an outstanding job. Well, I just think it's a significant game. We we disagree a little bit on on Adelaide. I think there's games you need to win, and he needs a win, as does a number of other clubs, including including Kenickley. There's no doubt about that.